uh, our webcast from the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. My name is Mark Goldwine. I'm the Senior Vice President and Senior Policy Director here. And I'm so pleased that we have so many people tuning in today uh, because today's been a really busy budget week. In fact, so busy we're not going to be able to discuss everything that happened this week. For example, in the debt ceiling returns yesterday morning. Uh, but we are going to try to go over as much as possible. And I really want to speed the opportunity for all of you to ask questions. So I'll try to keep this as short as, as short as I can and then focus this on just a broad discussion of everything budget. So speaking of budget, let's start with the president's budget, the president's skinny budget, which came out uh, just earlier this week. Uh, now, if we turn to the slide two, you basically can see the basic framework of what the president's budget is. And you all should see the slide right in front of you. But ordinarily, a new president releases a budget with five or usually 10 years of proposals that cover taxes, that cover mandatory spending, and that cover discretionary spending. It's not always as detailed. In fact, it's never as detailed as future budgets because they don't have very much time. But, and so that's why they call it the skinny budget. But this budget is particularly skinny. Mostly what it focuses on is just the discretionary budget and just fiscal year 2018. It does have a little bit of supplemental for this year, but mainly this is a proposal for what to do next year for the appropriators. And the president proposes that we lift defense spending by $54 billion paid for by cutting non-defense spending by about equal amount. Now, there's this $54 billion isn't just pulled out of the hat. Uh, what people maybe forget is that next year, sequestration, the sequester, is coming back. And so next year, there's actually a scheduled cut in defense spending. That full sequester equals $54 billion. And so what President Trump is proposing is to reverse that sequester. It's partially reversed this year, by the way. So he wants to reverse that sequester and therefore increase defense spending, again, paid for with reductions in non-defense spending. Now, non-defense is a pretty big category, so I think it's important to dive a little bit deeper as to where those spending cuts come from. So we go to slide three. We've itemized each of these cuts, at least by agency and area. You'll see the largest cuts overall um, come from the Department of Health and Human Services. This is about $13, $13 billion of cuts from last year, most of it in NIH spending, about $8 billion from the NIH. After after HHS, the next largest cut in dollar amount comes from the State Department. This is a very large cut in the State Department. It's cut by about 29% under President Trump's budget, mainly from foreign aid, totaling about $11 billion. Our third largest cut is in the area of education. Again, this isn't actually as big a percentage cut. It's only about 13%, I shouldn't say only, but compared to, say, some of the other cuts, it's a 13% percentage point cut, but it's $9 billion because we spent a lot on education. And this actually obscures the total cut because some of the larger cut of closer to 10 or 11 billion is going to pay for new school choice initiatives to expand charter schools, to pilot some school vouchers, things like that. Uh, now those three cuts together, those make up the majority of the 54 billion, actually 56 from last year, but there are other additional cuts throughout the budget. Almost every domestic area, basically every domestic area outside of money for veterans and money for social security agency uh, received some kind of reduction. I think we've heard a lot about how this budget would zero out spending on um, the uh, National Endowment for the Arts. It would zero out spending over time for, for public broadcast, for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, that's NPR and PBS. Uh, it would get rid of community development block grants within the Department of Housing and Urban Development. It would cut agriculture spending. There really are aggressive spending cuts throughout this, this budget. A lot of them are good ideas that we hear time and time again. Uh, a lot of them are pretty aggressive cuts uh, that are deeper than anything we've really seen in the past. Uh, as I alluded to briefly, there are two areas of the budget that do get a spending increase outside of defense. One is money for veterans, and all of this increase is specific to veterans' health. The other is Homeland Security, uh, where President Trump really wants to uh, build up border security and especially build that wall. And so, no, there's no line in the budget where Mexico is paying for it. Uh, the uh, appropriators, he's asking to put forward money both this year and for fiscal year 2018 to begin building this wall uh, on our southern border. So if you go to the next slide, I, I want to make a really important point here, which is uh, while the president deserves, deserves a lot of credit for fully paying for his defense increases, a lot of credit for paying for all of his defense increases with specific non-defense cuts, not just vague promises of reductions of $54 billion, but specific non-defense cuts. Uh, while he deserves a lot of credit for that, President Trump, in this budget, 
is ignoring about 70% of our total spending. So if you look at this uh, pie graph right here on the left, you'll see that defense discretionary, the part he wants to increase, is about 15% of our budget this year. You'll see non-defense discretionary, the part that he wants to cut, is about another 15%. That means 70% of the budget is unaccounted for. No proposals on Social Security, no proposals on Medicare, no proposals on Medicaid, on food stamps, no proposals related to his infrastructure plans. Most of the budget just isn't discussed here. And uh, that's a little more troubling for those of us that care about long-term budgeting because these two parts of the budget that make up 30% total, they are only responsible for 10% of spending growth. Looking at this other pie graph over on the right, you'll see most of our spending growth is driven by health care, by social security, and by interest on the debt. Very little spending growth over the next decade is driven by defense and non-defense. So while we give the president a lot of credit for specific offsets for these defense hikes, uh, he's not looking at a very large share of the budget, and he's not looking to the part of the budget that's growing. I should also mention that unlike other presidents' first budgets, he's not looking at the revenue side. You know, if you added up all of the tax breaks in the code, that's $1.6 trillion. That's, uh, that's much more. That's about two and a half times what we spend on non-defense discretionary spending. So that certainly needs to be looked at as well. Now, I hope we can talk more about the president's budget uh, in the Q&A, but I want to move on to another really big thing that's happening this week. If you go to the next kind of title slide, there's the name of it right there, the American Health Care Act. Uh, for years, Republicans have been talking about repealing and replacing Obamacare. For months, basically since the election, they've been talking how, about how to move forward legislatively to do that. We now have the first piece of that. We have uh, a piece of legislation that has passed two committees in the House of Representatives called the American Health Care Act that would repeal large parts of Obamacare, large parts of the Affordable Care Act, and replace it with something else. This week, we also received a score from the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. That's Congress's official scorekeeper. I like to think we're Congress's unofficial scorekeeper, but they're, our, they're the official scorekeeper about what this legislation would do. So let me start with, before I even talk about that, what the legislation won't do. This is called repeal and replace, but there's actually large parts of Obamacare this legislation won't replace. The Affordable Care Act said that anyone that's under the age of 26 can continue to be covered under the parents' plan. That is unchanged. The Affordable Care Act said that companies, insurance companies can't charge different amounts based on pre-existing conditions or based on the risk of having a condition. That doesn't change. So there's still what's called a guaranteed issue, that everybody that wants insurance is allowed to buy it at pretty much the same price. Uh, and most of the regulations, in fact, in the Affordable Care Act haven't changed. What does change in this new bill uh, is the mandates from the Affordable Care Act, the individual employer mandates, are repealed. The subsidies in the Affordable Care Act are ultimately repealed and replaced, so they have a new set of subsidies. The Medicaid is phased down. The Medicaid expansion from the Affordable Care Act is phased down over time. Most of the taxes, not all, but most of the taxes from the Affordable Care Act are repealed. Um, and there's some regulatory changes. For example, under the Affordable Care Act, insurance companies could only charge three times as much for, say, somebody that's age 64 versus 21, even though it actually cost more than five times as much. This bill relaxes that and says insurance companies can charge up to five times as much based on age. So Congressional Budget Office came out with their analysis, and they really looked at a few things. First, they looked at what are the budgetary implications. And it turns out over the next decade, this is actually a little bit of a net win for the federal budget. The legislation repeals most of the Medicaid expansion. What it says to states essentially is you can continue to offer expanded coverage, but instead of offering you a, instead of the federal government paying for almost all of it, 90%, we're gonna ultimately just pay you the same amount we pay for the rest of your Medicaid, which varies by state from 50 to 75% and averages um, between 60 and 70%. It says that for people that are currently on that, first of all, it says nothing changes before before 2020, and for people that are currently in the Medicaid pop expansion population, they can continue getting that, ex that higher rate so long as they stay in Medicaid. So it kind of pairs back that Medicaid expansion, doesn't repeal it entirely. It also, to further control Medicaid cost growth, puts a cap on how fast Medicaid can grow on a per person basis in each category. So it says that for all of the elderly in Medicaid, growth can only grow by about health inflation per person each year. For all the disabled in, um, in Medicaid, 
cost can only grow by per person health inflation each year. And it does that through all these categories. Therefore, both providing some incentive for states that have more cost control, but also sticking states with the full burden if costs do exceed this cap. One last additional piece of savings, that, uh, this new health care bill repeals after 2020 all of the subsidies from the Affordable Care Act. Right now, the Affordable Care Act offers subsidies that are both based on people's health care costs and based on their income. So if you're at 150% of the poverty line, the federal government is going to pay for most of your insurance premiums, um, and they're also going to pay for some of your cost sharing. This legislation repeals that. So when you add all of this together, the, the, the repeal of the Medicaid expansion for the most part, the repeal of the subsidies, uh, and the, the per capita caps on Medicaid, along with some other minor spending cuts, this legislation actually saves about $1.7 trillion. Now that's not the total deficit of that, because it takes most of that $1.7 trillion and it dedicates it elsewhere. Uh, about a third of that money goes to new coverage provisions. So remember I said that this legislation gets rid of the existing income-based subsidies, but it replaces it with new flat tax credits that are based on age. So for somebody that's buying the individual market that's in their 60s, um, in their early 60s, they will get a $4,000 tax credit per person. For somebody that's in their 20s, they will get a $2,000 tax credit per person. And those tax credits are indexed. So that costs some money. The legislation also gives money to states that they can spend to stabilize the insurance markets, uh, along with another of other provisions. That spends about a third of the money. Another third of the savings, another third of that $1.7 trillion, you can see from this slide, uh, goes to repealing many of the tax increases that were in the Affordable Care Act. Basically, the Affordable Care Act had about $600 billion of tax increases. This legislation reverses almost all of those. One exception, there's a tax called the Cadillac tax in the Affordable Care Act. This legislation doesn't repeal it, it just delays it till 2025. Lastly, the legislation repeals the mandates, as I said, which loses us tax revenue. So when you take all the savings, that $1.7 trillion of savings, you subtract, as you can see here, the $1.3 trillion of cost, what we're left with is $337 billion of net deficit reduction. Not going to solve our debt situation, but not bad. Uh, if you go to the next slide, if you go to slide seven, we break this down in a little bit more detail. And I'd encourage folks to visit crfb.org, where we have a whole paper on this, where you can kind of look in more detail. I'm not going to walk through this again. Just want to point out that this legislation saves a lot of money. It recycles it into new spending and tax cuts, leaves us with a net deficit reduction of about $340 billion. And we're going to come out with an analysis later today that shows that over two decades, that savings is likely to be about two trillion dollars. Now, of course, if you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, the savings isn't free. The savings isn't just for making um, everybody happier and more efficient. Uh, most of the savings comes from the fact that this legislation would cover fewer people. Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, subsidizes many people's insurance, both through the individual market subsidies and through Medicaid. Uh, this legislation subsidizes fewer people at a lower rate, um, and it also doesn't have the mandates. As a result, CBO estimates that by 2026, when this thing is fully phased in, there will be 24 million people less with health insurance than there are today. About 7 million of those are coming from the employer market. In other words, employers will drop some folks. That's partially because of the mandates, partially because the tax credits are actually more widely available. They're not really income related, except for at the very top. Uh, there will be about a 3 million person reduction in the non-group and individual markets. And there will be about a $14 million reduction in Medicaid. So you can see here, most of this coverage loss is coming from Medicaid, but there is coverage loss across the board. If I were to break this down by age and income, what we would also see is that within the non-group market, there's probably an increase in the people that are covered that are, say, under the age of 30 or maybe even under the age of 40. But there's a large decrease in the folks that are in their 50s and their early 60s who are covered because after-tax premiums would increase significantly under this legislation. Now again, I want to ask, I want to answer a lot of questions about the Health Care Act in the Q and A. Uh, CBO does have a lot of other analysis, and Congress is working right now, hopefully, to improve this legislation, uh, both on the cost and coverage front. But I do want to move now to one last issue that happened this week, which is the Federal Reserve met and decided to raise interest rates. Now, this is a long time coming. Interest rates have been at historic lows, uh, and the Federal Reserve has said, as the economy is recovering. Unemployment, by the way, is below 5%. They're going to start to raise interest rates gradually. 
in order to avoid inflation. And they've done it now this week for the third time, and they're probably going to do it another two times over the course of the next year. Now, this is economic management, and we don't really weigh in on monetary policy. But when interest rates go up, either from the Federal Reserve or from what's going on in the rest of the economy, it does have um, impacts on the rest of the federal government. If you turn to slide nine, slide ten, excuse me, uh, you can see how we think that rising interest rates is going to affect, for example, the Treasury bonds. Treasury rates are near historic lows. A year ago today, they were at about historic lows. They've gone up a little bit. They're now starting to rise, and as both the Federal Reserve raises its own rates, and as economies globally and here continue to recover and normalize, we expect those rates to continue to rise, not to their historic averages, it does seem like there's a reduction, but to rise somewhat. And if you go to this last slide, slide 11, you can see that's going to have very serious implications for the federal budget and the federal government. Interest spending is the single fastest growing category of the budget over the next 10 years. In 2016, we spent about $240 billion on interest. That's not very much when you consider that we have $14 trillion worth of debt. But by 2027, we're projected to spend $770 billion. And by the way, if our debt rose, so too are our interest rates. So too are our interest payments. Uh, as interest rates and payments rise, this is crowding out everything else. The more money we spend on interest, and the more money, by the way, we spend on entitlements, the less we have available for important domestic discretionary priorities, for important military security priorities, for important tax policies. There's a trade-off here. And so while um, we don't think the answer here is to try to keep interest rates low forever, that's kind of a pipe dream, we do think that the United States government should reduce its debt and therefore reduce the effect insulate itself from some of the potential costs of rising interest rates. We can't solve this all at once, but we need to start doing it today. Uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in, and I, I hope there's some really interesting questions. My colleague Corbin is behind the camera, is, is reading through your questions now. Mark, maybe you could start by talking to us a little bit about um, what you currently see projected as the um, as the remainder of um, President Trump's budget proposal, the piece that was missing from this, yeah. and if we have any information on what to expect uh, from that moving forward. That's a great question. So we've only gotten a little peek at the president's budget. As we said in kind of a press release last week, uh, normal budgets show us the entire thing over 10 years. This is just 30% of the budget over. We need 100% of a plan for 10 years, not 30% of a plan for one year. Uh, but we do expect and hope that more is going to come in May. right? So uh, in May, the president is supposed to release his full budget. That's going to, first of all, include 10 years worth of discretionary spending policies. And um, while I think it's really appreciated the president has line at him what he wants to do this year, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what he what has to do over the next 10 years. If he's going to further tighten on defense discretionary spending below these cuts, or if he's going to let them grow with inflation. If he's going to continue to let defense rise, or if this is kind of a one-time boost, that'll be really interesting. What I'm more concerned about is what is going to happen to the tax and entitlement programs. Because we know President Trump wants to cut taxes. And I'm all, all for cutting tax rates, because it turns out that uh, comprehensive tax reform with lower rates is really good for economic growth. Uh, my view is that we have to do that in the context of a plan that also cuts tax rates and raises revenue. Uh, if we don't do that, if we do it in the context of a plan that reduces revenue, that puts us a step backwards as when it comes to the national debt. And it'll be interesting to see how President Trump's budget deals with that and deals with the national debt. It'll also be interesting to see what he does in infrastructure. He said he wants a trillion dollar infrastructure plan, but some of that is going to come from the private sector. We don't know what that's going to look like yet. Is there going to be an infrastructure bank? Is there going to be big countries and highway funds? Is there going to be public-private partnerships, tax credits? That will be really interesting to see. Again, there's potential cost here. So let's assume that there is some tax cuts and there is some infrastructure. We already have a debt situation where President Trump entered office with higher debt than any president but Truman, 77% of GDP. Even under current law, that's projected to rise to 89%, $10 trillion over the next decade. If we threw in a trillion dollars of tax cuts and a trillion dollars of infrastructure, then it would rise $12 trillion. So I want to know what is he going to do about that. We can, I suspect the money is not coming from the non-defense discretionary. First, because it's small, and secondly, because those cuts are going to defense. That means there really needs to be a tough look at the entitlement programs. Our largest programs are Social Security, followed by Medicare, followed by defense, followed by Medicaid. 
any plan that doesn't deal with those programs um, and doesn't also deal with our tax expenditures is unlikely to stabilize and balance and approve the debt and it's almost definitely not going to balance the budget so i'd be curious to see what his plans are and how he wants to get us in a more sustainable fiscal track staying uh staying with the budget here for one minute we have a question here via email um could you talk a little bit about the um the 2017 budget and the CR process moving forward as to where um, where Congress picks up uh, from the president's budget proposal and what are the next steps we see moving forward? Right, so President Trump's budget for the most part is a discussion of what's happening for fiscal year 2018, which starts in October. But we haven't fully resolved what's gonna happen in fiscal year 2017, because right now we're operating on temporary funding that's scheduled to end in April. We basically have three choices going forward. One option is we can continue to do what's called a continuing resolution, where we just basically spend what we're spending now, which is what we spent last year, through the end of the year. We can make some adjustments, but basically just keep it fixed, and then let's worry about 2018. That's option one. Option two is to go through a modified version of regular order, where the appropriators come out with bills for each specific topic. And we've already seen some of these start to come out. You know, for each different, there's 12 different appropriations bill covering defense, covering um, education covering housing and urban development and covering transportation. So we could see that. I think the most likely of this option is some version of what's called an omnibus, where we take a bunch of appropriations bills and lump them together. Uh, maybe this omnibus will be some mix of detailed appropriations and continuing resolutions, and maybe it'll be completely new. I don't know if we'll see yet. What we do know from President Trump's budget is that he wants to take whatever we do and add $30 billion of gross cost to that, only pay for half of it. He basically wants to plus up defense spending by $30 billion. He wants another $3 billion for the defense wall. And he's proposing $18 billion in non-defense cuts. I think it's going to be a little tough to get those cuts that quickly. Uh, I also think that that's a lot of money to be spending for only a small portion of the year. So I, I mean, I think I, I would urge them to limit how much they want to boost this funding for 20. 2017 and really focus on 2018. But to the extent they do boost funding, they really should make sure they're paying for it because we're not adding to the debt. Switching gears a little bit back to healthcare, John uh, via the web asked, how could Republicans fix the American Healthcare Act tax credit structure? <laughs> so I think this is a great question because the tax credit structure in this current legislation basically is flat but age rated. And there's a really big benefit to this being a flat credit as compared to Obamacare's um, income-based credit, which is it doesn't it doesn't have a work disincentive in it. With an income-based credit, the more you work, the less you get. So there's a work disincentive. The advantage of this flat tax credit is it's no work disincentive, so it's probably pro growth. But there's also at least two big disadvantages, maybe three. One is it's probably not big enough for many people that are um, at the low rungs of the income ladder, particularly older people, to have afford their premiums. That's concern number one. Concern number two, it's not geographically based, and so areas like Alaska that have way higher premiums get the same credits um, as if it's like Ohio that have pretty low premiums. Uh, and concern number three is the age rating doesn't seem to, to match the variability of premium costs. You know, under, under this new piece of legislation, premiums can vary as much as five to one. So people that are 64 years old can have premiums that are five times as expensive as people that are age 21. That makes sense, actually, because that's kind of reflective of their cost. But these premiums are only two to one. It's just $4,000 for that person that's 64, just two, and it's $2,000. My advice would be, first of all, let's start by fixing this age rating. Uh, this, this bill gives $2,000 per child. Uh, if you go to, even under current law, and want to add a child to your health insurance plan, it's not necessarily going to cost you $2,000. Certainly, with this five to one age rating, it's not. So we're probably actually over-subsidizing for children. We're giving more in tax benefit bills who need in premiums. We can probably reduce that a little bit. Um, we're also probably over-subsidizing the rich. This does have a little bit of a means test. It says that starting at $75,000 for an individual and $150,000 for a family, we're gonna gradually phase out your benefit. But it's very gradually, and that's actually pretty high up the income ladder. For comparison, for an individual, the Affordable Care Act stops giving any benefit after about uh, $45,000, and it's phasing out well before that. Uh, this, by the way, has another negative effect, which is by giving the credits to everybody, it actually pulls people from the employer market. Employers, some employers are more likely to drop coverage when they know most of their employers will get a credit. So here's what I would advise. Let's 
reduce that child benefit a little bit. Let's firm up that means testing so we're not really giving credit to people that are above. You know, maybe we start to phase out at 300% of the poverty line, even 250, and we get it fully phased out by 400 or 500. So let's use that money to boost the credits, especially for the oldest folks and the poorest folks. I think if they did that, uh, these credits would be a lot more effective, both in covering people's premiums and in boosting coverage. And you could do it without actually costing very much more. One additional question here from Chester. Um, what do you all think will happen to the debt if interest rates rise faster slash get more and in, slash increases get more normal? Uh, this has to be a setup question. I'm so glad that somebody uh, asked it because if you check out our website, crfp.org, I'm not just joking, it's not really it, but if you check out our website, crfp.org, you'll see we did a paper on this just yesterday, um, excuse me, just two days ago. If interest rates were to rise to more normal levels, which is basically, um, you know, a point and a half higher than where they're projected, it would cost us about two and a half trillion dollars over the next day, two and a half trillion dollars. If they're just going up by one percentage point, uh, it would cost us about one, $1.6 trillion. So the effect and the risk of interest rates being higher is really quite expensive. It means that instead of debt rising by 10 trillion over the next decade, it could be rising by 12 or 13 trillion dollars. That's a big difference when you think about our economic growth. Now it's also true, there's a possibility that interest rates will rise slower, and then that's gonna put us in a better situation in terms of interest rates. But we really don't wanna take that risk. The problem is, when your debt levels are really high, you're really subject to interest rate less risk. When your debt levels are low, doesn't make a big difference if interest rates are at 8% or at 4%. When, you're when your debt is really high, small increases in interest rates can have big effects on how much money we have available to pay for just about everything else. John here asked, how would the health care plan fit in with the GOP's next big agenda item, tax reform? Ah, so <laughs> the plan, and maybe not everything is going quite at the pace that they hoped, is that Republicans were gonna pass for field place and then focus on tax reform. There's some interaction, but these really are pretty separate agenda items. I mean, I do want to point out this health care plan includes some tax cuts. It's not really new tax cuts, but it basically is, is reversing the tax increases from Obamacare. And one of those tax increases in particular, the net income investment tax, which is 3.8% uh, investment tax, uh, interacts with what they want to do with the rest of the tax code. But most of them are kind of separate. So I think, in my mind, repeal and replace goes in one bucket for the most part tax reform in another. Um, but tax reform could get really expensive either way. There's broad agreement on reducing rates, which again, sign me up, I want lower rates too. Uh, the agreement starts to fade when it comes to how to pay for it. They really gotta get rid of these tax expenditures, as many as possible, and there's some willingness to do that, but there's also some disagreement. There's some disagreement on this border adjustment, there's disagreement on the interest deductibility on state and local taxes. I would really advise that they spend a lot more time thinking about how they're going to get rid of these tax breaks so they can pay for those rate cuts. And what you really want tax reform to do is grow the economy enough that we're actually producing more revenue and put that to deficit reduction, uh, not using that revenue just to pay for more rate reduction. Rich here asks, how will the budget worsen the financial state of Medicare Hospital Insurance Trust Fund? Well, the budget won't have any effect because, as I mentioned before, this particular budget only looks at 30% of all spending, and that 30% is just defense and non-defense. Now, this health care bill, uh, as it currently stands, will worsen the state of the Medicare Trust Fund. We did an analysis. Again, I keep plugging our website, but it, it's a very valuable resource, crfb.org. We did an analysis of how much this piece of health legislation would affect the Medicare Trust Fund. And it turns out over the next decade, it would cost the trust fund about $150 billion and it would advance the insolvency date of Medicare Part A from 2025 to 2023. If you think about it, 2023 is pretty darn close for now. Um, it's when you know people that are 59 are gonna be just retired. People that are 65 and just on Medicare are gonna be 71. So this is, cons this is highly concerning. Now, this is totally fixable. There's basically two things that are driving this legislation for hurting Medicare. One is it gets rid of a surtax on um, Medicare hospital insurers. That's the main driver. The second is that it spends a little bit more money on what's called disproportionate share of hospital payments, which basically means it increases money for uncompensated care, which makes sense if your uninsurance rate is higher. Um, my advice for fixing the first is in place of this Medicare surtax, they could broaden the Medicare payroll tax base. We hear Republicans all the time talking about how there's tax favorability of healthcare, and they're right. 
Most of that's in the income tax, but a small part of it is within the Medicare payroll tax. If they just treated employer health benefits the same as other wages for that 2.9% health insurance tax, they would make up for the loss from the payroll tax surtax and then have money left over. They could also pay for this disproportionate share of hospital increase by some modest reductions elsewhere in Medicare. President Obama had $400 billion of Medicare reductions for, for gosh sakes. I mean, it shouldn't be that difficult for us to find reforms to Medicare that improve quality and still slow growth spending in that program. Okay, Mark, we have one final question via email uh, asking, what steps can President Trump take to correct some of the budgetary issues that you've outlined during the presentation? Well, I think the biggest thing is we need to, where's the meat? We need to see the full budget. So far, we've only seen President Trump's defense and non-defense. And look, people are going to disagree vehemently about a lot of these non-defense cuts. And I, and I think that makes sense because a lot of them are pretty harsh and pretty areas. But I, I think as budget folks, we need to respect that he's outlining the specific cuts. That's a really important step. He's saying what he wants to do. Um, what I would urge is, assuming he can't get all those cuts, and I do think there's going to be opposition to Congress, he doesn't decide to keep the defense increases but not pay for them. He decides to either reduce the defense increases somewhat, maybe $30 billion instead of 54, or he decides to pay for it with the mandatory budget. So step one is, let's make sure we stick to this idea of paying for things, even if that particular mix of pay for that he did isn't the right one. Step two is, we need to see what he's going to do to our largest spending programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the rest of the budget. And we need to see what he does to the tax code. And I'm really hopeful that as they run through the numbers, and I, I think his OMB director, Congressman Mulvaney, um, or Director Mulvaney you now, is really understands this better than anyone. I hope as they go through the numbers, they'll realize you can't give everybody everything for free. We're going to have to slow the growth of the entitlement programs. We're going to have to look at the revenue side of the ledger. And we're going to hear about some of these promises. And if we do all three of those things just a little bit, we can really fix our debt situation and I think make most of us better off in the process. So I think that's our last question. I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. And I hope we're going to do these again soon and regularly, although rarely are those budget weeks as exciting as this one. If you have more questions I didn't get to, please feel free to email me. My address is goldwine, G-O-L-D-W-E-I-N, at crfb.org. Email me anytime. And again, visit our website. And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much.